Okay. Oh, thank you very much, Susan, and thank you for asking me to uh, give a talk here. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be here and, and wonderful talks to, to listen to. Uh, I'm not a forensic psychologist, I'm a neuropsychologist in rehabilitation and, and so on. So this is uh, kind of new to me. And I became interested, well, particularly interested in this area. Can you hear me okay, by the way? I have a rather soft voice, it's uh, okay. Um, and uh, it's because I was uh, supervising a student who turned out to be a prison uh, officer uh, at Exeter Prison. And she asked me to go down to the prison to, um, to do a memory uh, kind of seminar with, with the prisoners and, and some of the guards. Because I had a memory book coming out then, 10 Steps to a Better Memory, or Memory Boosters Workout, £3.50 on Amazon if you want it. <laughs> It's very good, a 10 steps. My mother thinks it's great and hands it out to people. Um, anyway, uh, so, the, uh, so we went down and did the, did the thing, and one of the prisoners uh, said, well, that was very interesting, very, very, very good, but um, could you explain to me, to me, why is it that when, when I touch myself over here, I get these wonderful sensations? It's, well, it's quite wonderful. It's like fireworks going off and tingling sensations and all kinds of like It's beautiful. And he had a shaved head, so I can see that he had a square area here um, of skull missing underneath his skin. And he was actually pressing himself in a sensory motor tract area. <laughs> and I uh, thought, well, one thing is, uh, don't do it. Uh, it's not very good for you, because uh, you're just pressing on your brain. Um, and secondly, you need some new surgery. You have a little titanium flap put on there, some surgery. And it made me think, what are the gaps in service between prisons and the NHS? And at that time, 10 years ago, the gaps were huge and, and uh, getting worse, according to all kinds of reviews, people like Sina Fasel and, uh, and, and so on. So that's where I became interested in, in this kind of area. And, um, and I must mention funders and colleagues, uh, um, wonderful colleagues and great funders, uh, like Barrow Cabri Trust and the ESRC. Um, so uh, crime, um, as, uh, um, uh, as you know, in, in general, so, so I'm very, in, in general terms, it's kind of down, uh, but reoffending rates are very high. And um, I'm listening to the last talk. No wonder reoffending is, is, is uh, a big issue because we don't really use our rehabilitation opportunities as we might in terms of picking up the mental health issues that people have uh, and so on. Uh, reoffending costs the British economy around £13 billion pounds a year, which is a huge amount of money, uh, which is very handy to put into your research grants, I find um, a good thing to do. Um, so uh, obviously, as you would all know, the, um, the, the time when people are really at risk of, of crime is in their teenage years and late adolescent years. Um, and in a sense, I was listening to the previous speaker, so I was thinking, well, where does my talk fit here? Well, my talk fits in, these are the kind of people, the kind of people we're seeing and uh, doing research with are the kind of people who, if we don't get more services around them, become the people who end up in secure systems of the kind that you are mostly working in, it looks like. Um, just by the way, to did a quick check on meta-analyses. Uh, I didn't run this myself. Uh, I just looked at uh, Google's meta-analyses of the risk of um, psychosis after a traumatic brain injury, and it's times two. So if you have a head injury, you're much more likely to develop psychosis and all the rest of it, so, um, and, and crime and everything else. So anyway, it's a big problem, especially in adolescents. Um, stumbling into this area as a neuropsychologist, I was intrigued to find that uh, the uh, people who offend are largely characterised by having problems with impulse control, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, problems controlling their emotions, uh, problem solving is poor, inflexible in thinking, lack of empathy, and can't really figure out what consequences of the behaviour. To me, to a neuropsychologist, that tends to shout this executive syndrome of some, co uh, of some sort. Um, I'm sorry, I'm quite, quite, uh, uh, there's a lot of information here, um, and, and I can't do justice to all the various kind of ways in which brain injury is, might be potentially one predictive factor uh, rather than causal factor um, uh, in, in, in crime. There's lots of other kind of factors. Um, and, um, but uh, the, the, over the last few years, there's increased um, literature uh, showing that there's, uh, it's important to try to take account of brain injury in, in, um, uh, in people who offend. But also it's important to th think about things like neurodevelopmental disability um, uh, and, and maturation of the brain. Go again, can I think about previous speakers, um, think about the brains being somewhat different in, in the various conditions, and why is that? Well, the brain is still emerging and developing through childhood and adolescence and young adulthood, so it's a very vulnerable uh, kind of system uh, to various uh, potentials. I've got Shakespeare up there just uh, because uh, he, his answer to reducing crime was to do away with teenage years. And would there be no age between 10 and 23, for there's nothing in between but inventing in wenches with child, wronging the agency, stealing and fighting. It goes on to say uh, that actually, but you need the teenage years for somebody to be silly enough to go out into the woods and uh, will do what they like in the woods, but also catch some deer. So you, so you need risk takers in society, but also it's a bit of a problem. So just um, very briefly, of course, 
that's the range of uh, changes. Oh, there's a bit missing there. Okay. Anyway, there's uh, there's um, uh, 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 there's lots of uh, work um, showing how the brain is going through various changes in development. Age three, age seven, age fourteen to seventeen. Why am I telling you about this? Well, because the brains of the people that we end up seeing uh, typically were developing at the point at which they were injured, and we don't know the consequences of those injuries to those brains. Um, well, because the brain is still evolving and changing and developing. It's a bit missing there, but uh, I might get back. It might, oh, it might appear. Okay, so brain injury. I don't know how much of you guys, in terms of the medics and nurses and so on, think about brain injury on a regular basis, but um, uh, and know about brain injury. I'm sure you know lots. Um, uh, just very briefly, uh, typically in, in brain injuries um, uh, from fast stop, so injuries like car accidents and assaults and so on, the brain is moved around inside the skull, hits the inside of the skull, and kind of hits the back of the skull. So coup and contra coup effects. And as you'll know, looking into the skull over here, there's the kind of various kind of bits of bone um, that uh, makes the skull a bit like a cheese grater for the brain. It's a bit like a jelly to be going like this when a, when a car accident happens. Is that clear enough? You kind of, okay, right. Nice image. Um, uh, oh, yeah, it's in Yellow Dog. Uh, I used to use this image a lot, but it's now in, in Martin Amos's book, The Yellow Dog. Anyway, so, so the brain moves around, so no wonder the areas of the brain typically injured are in the areas where the, the frontal areas, temporal and limbic systems, crucial areas for thinking ahead, planning, being flexible and and, uh, and and all the rest of it. Now, um, also of course, is diffuse white matter injury, which is vital. This is the cross connection across the brain, corpse colossum and the various fascicula that connect up the brain. And there's a lot of connectivity. We're showing in our rugby players that we do diffuse tensor imaging in. There's a lot of connectivity in diffuse white matter tracts with three or more kind of concussions. So um, diffuse white matter injuries, even in mild injuries, is potentially problematic. Um, levels of brain injury, this is a bit of the, the, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll know, but uh, just as a reminder, in the same way as crime is a big uh, thing in adolescence, brain injury is a big thing in adolescence. But, um, so that's kind of our rates in our local emergency department. But the important thing I want to pull out, apart from the boys between 15 and 23 having lots of brain injuries, 60% um, involving alcohol, there's also the young kids, uh, the under fives, the three-year-olds, um, boys and girls, lots of brain injuries in the young as well. They're toddling, they're falling over, especially from deprived areas. And that's probably one of these big background risk factors, the silent epidemic that is brain injury that triggers the brain to develop differently, which then leads to things possibly like psychosis and the problems as well. Um, Sina Fessel, who has been mentioned a couple of times, has just published a wonderful uh, kind of study on um, long, uh, longitudinal follow-up on brain injury in the Swedish data sets, showing all manner of psychiatric um, morbidities down the line. So, uh, what happens to the brain injury? Um, you've got problems with attention, executive function, disinhibition, and anger. Uh, about 60% of kids have a moderate severe brain injury, so knocked out for 15 to um, 20 minutes or more. Uh, they will have organic personality change characterized by irritability and problems in managing their, their emotions. But also that happens after mild brain injury as well. In a much smaller group, about 5%, but 80% of all injuries are mild. So it's a big issue across the board. And brain injury is the biggest cause, I will say this theatrically, is the biggest cause of death and disability in children and working age adults, biggest. So it's a huge problem, an increasing uh, problem, particularly in, in, in areas like China, India, kind of globally, because of increased mobility. Now just to, um, uh, uh, in one of the areas that are particularly vulnerable, the social brain, Oops, there's the, this bit's missing from the talk now, which is quite annoying, but um, it's disappeared somehow, I'm not quite sure why. Um, the social brain, which involves the amygdala, the kind of prefrontal cortex, the, the fusiform area, that all these sort of areas that look at the face and decide kind of what's the emotion in the face, what should I do with that face, should I feel frightened, should I feel insecure, shall I become paranoid? Those areas, the social brain, are particularly affected with the brain injury. And we've shown in kids with brain injury that when they become teenagers, they're poor at recognizing the emotions of others. They're poor at theory in mind, they're poor on empathic awareness. And they become more suspicious um, and not quite sure what to do with themselves. So it's a nice study by um, Brian, uh, Ryan in, in Melbourne um, uh, showing this in longitudinal studies. So the realms to, uh, to, um, uh, to crime. There's some nice longitudinal kind of studies linking, and again, my, uh, kind of uh, cause, uh, 
causality is very problematic in this area, but uh, Timonen showed in 2002 that if you followed up about 10,000 people uh, who were born in the north of Finland and you looked at what happened to them over about 30 years, you were four times more likely to become a mentally disordered offender if you had a brain injury at some point. And interestingly mentioned about um, uh, uh, the temporal uh, um, kind of issues, the, uh, the crime history started after the brain injury, so the temporally coherent. So that's an interesting study. Um, then uh, Adrian Rain also showed that uh, if you want to look at adolescent limited offending and, and adolescent um, offending that turned into lifetime offending, the big one of the big characteristics of the ones who were adolescent limited offenders was that they weren't knocked out. So, um, so if you're adolescent who offend and they get knocked out a few times, they're more likely to become adults who also offend. Um, I think what's happened is, oh, I, I, anyway, I think what's happened is that the talk I'm giving you is from your slides, and my actual talk is different because I put in the other things into it. So I'm, I'm sorry. Um, this is a larger uh, study and review for study by Sina Fassell, um, published a, a couple of years ago, showing that uh, there was an increased risk of um, crime after a traumatic brain injury. If you look at the population registers in Sweden for uh, health conditions, brain injury, and you look at the records for violence, then what we were able to find was that in the general population, about 2.5% of the general population became violent offenders at some point, whereas if there was a brain injury documented in the hospital records, it was more like 9%. Then what they did is look at the siblings uh, the, of, the, of the head injured who became offenders and their level of, of offending was around 4.5% of them became violent offenders. So what seems to be the case is that brain injury ramps up the risk of offending behaviour uh, in those who may already have some susceptibility to offending, not sure. Um, this is a study in New Zealand. Uh, this is a, an interesting study because it's a longitudinal kind of follow-up study of kids who, um, uh, and uh, these are kids uh, in, in, in Christchurch, and when they had an injury when they were about the age of five, compared to kids who had orthopedic injuries and other kind of um, kids in the control groups, and um, what they found in these studies in Christchurch was that within about a year or two after the mild traumatic brain injury, and this is just mild, um, so they may have been kept in for observation or not, they started to increase the risk of having problems in concentration and attention in school within about two years and within four years they were um, getting excluded from school and by the time they were 14 and 15 they were in trouble with the law, so fire setting and, and, and things like that. So, the, so, it's, so it seems to suggest that if you were better at trying to pick up on brain injuries earlier in, in children's lives, in young people's lives, and try to keep them in school, they may offset future offending at some point. Um, in terms of the prison populations, uh, the, the, um, we've been doing some kind of work in, in, in this area and this is other work relatedly. And uh, if you look at the prevalence of, of, um, uh, of uh, brain injury related issues in populations in prison. Oh, and I need to switch. Hang on one second. I'm going to switch to the other talk because this has lost all the graphics because it's the wrong one. Um, and just see, this is, should be this one, I think. Aha. Right. See this one? Yes, it is this one. So what you missed so far, because we were on the wrong talk, uh, was, hang on, from beginning, um, ah, what I failed to tell you at the beginning, if you wanted to fall asleep, feel free to do so. It's very tiring uh, to listen to me going on. And you can read most of what I'm going to tell you in this report, Repairing Shattered Lives, um, uh, which was produced to tra help uh, develop policy in the area. You can download it and click through links and, 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 and get all of that if you want to. Um, if you don't want to fall asleep, that's fine too. Um, and uh, um, so, okay. Um, so where were we? Um, yeah. Here we are. Okay. So, um, uh, there was a nice study a couple of years ago. Um, it was an opportunistic study looking at data gathered um, in Germany on, um, on prisoners who were violent or non-violent and then controls, looking at uh, neuroimaging findings. Um, in, uh, because they were referred for you know, any issue, like having had headaches or you know, kind of problems with fatigue or sleep disorders, and somehow or another they ended up doing scans on lots of kind of prisoners, CT scans, MRI scans. It's interesting to note that in, um, there were hundreds of, of prisoners kind of scanned, 
In those um, who were violent, compared to those who were non, not violent offenders, there were many more lesions in the frontal lobes of those who were violent offenders. And your discussion is interesting. They said, well, we're not quite sure why. It could be something to do with maybe having brain injuries. Which brings us to uh, one of our first studies in this area, uh, through Exeter Prison, where we, um, we just did a, 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 a survey of, of the prisoners in terms of their level of, of symptoms that they may have and also whether they ever had a, uh, a head injury. 43% uh, response rate, which is not brilliant, um, of about 400 uh, prisoners, sentences are remanded. Uh, usual kind of uh, kind of crimes, violent offences, shoplifting, burglary, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, in the typical, in the general population, about 11% of the population will have had a head injury. So 11% of the population in this room will have had a head injury. About uh, eight or, uh, or, or nine of those would be mild injuries, and two or three might be more moderate severe. So that's the level in the general population. In this prison population, it's um, around 60% to 65%. That's how many said, I've had a head injury. 16% having had a moderate severe brain injury. So that's involved being knocked out for long enough for the brain to be very, very likely to have been changed. And their personality, well, however we understand personality, to be somewhat changed uh, one way or another. The really important thing from our perspective, because we've look, been looking at, looking at uh, kids with range a lot at this, at this point in our research group, was the uh, finding that if there was a head injury history, they tended to be in prison from much younger. So they were 16 years of age on, in general, compared to 21 in non-brain injured. So it might be that the brain injury uh, is uh, associated with kind of earlier imprisonment. Um, and also interesting, it was a, a brain injury was associated with more frequent uh, um, periods of custody. So you're much more likely to say, no, this is not my first time in custody if there's a head injury. It's a causal, don't know, but it's certainly there as a factor that's interesting to note. We then looked at a young offender um, institution where there were um, about 200 offenders and we managed to get a response rate of 98%. That's pretty good, isn't it? And you some reinforcement for that research. We tried very hard. We also gave up vouchers and stuff um, for iPods, um, I think. Uh, anyway, is it, um, and uh, there was a, a usual range of offences. 27% uh, violence, 25% shoplifting, theft, robbery, and so on and so forth. In this group, the young offender unit, and again, at this point, about 2,000 young people between the f ages of 14 to 18 are in young offender units in, U in England. It's now down to about 1,400, I gather. So in this group, very representative of the population, 65% reported a head injury. Mild TBI with loss of consciousness of up to 10 minutes or moderate severe brain injury in 46% of the sample. So about half have a, have a relevant brain injury. Now just as a reminder, if I haven't said this already or emphasized it enough, the brains of adolescents are more vulnerable, not only to being injured, but are more vulnerable to having uh, to being injured uh, in, in and of itself. So they're, they're more vulnerable because how they, where they sit, they're not fully connected up yet. The modules aren't fully uh, evolved. So the brains of adolescents are more problematic in terms of being hit and they don't develop kind of um, neurotypically. 17% of moderate severe um, brain injury, so that's a, a large amount. Then you look at uh, the links between brain injury and violence, what you find is that those with more brain injuries, the ones with three or more, are might more likely to be in for more violent offences and have a history of greater violence in their offending as well. Again, problematic in terms of uh, associations, causal or not, but this seems to be a factor that's complicating their rehabilitation because they're in prison more often and they're in for crimes that are getting more uh, kind of serious as they go along. Um, we then did the further study to look at um, if you ask them whether they have <coughs> symptoms of brain injury and then you ask them whether they had a head injury or not, then you find that these kids in these prisons tend to tell you, well, I've, yeah, I've got problems with remembering things, I've got headaches, I'm fatigue, I've got, I'm irritable. And then you say, well, and have you ever had a head injury? Yes. Um, so if they say yes to having had a head injury uh, and, and yes to more, more head injuries, they're more likely to be reporting symptoms consistent with having head injuries. So in other words, they're not lying about their symptoms, which is one of the um, issues here. Are they able to give good reports? So basically, the more knockouts they have in terms of length of time and the more number of knockouts they have, the more symptoms of brain injury that they, they seem to have. Uh, importantly, over here, if the loss of consciousness is more than 30 minutes, they don't report very much. What's the reason for that? Lack of insight, likely, because they might not be very good at reporting about their brain injury. So insight is a big issue in this population. 
Um, and we just finished uh, another study, um, and uh, Pratibha Chiyas Bison uh, was leading on this study. Didn't um, I haven't got all the data on me, but uh, I was um, uh, where this should be published early next year. Now, because now we have um, a new system for screening for brain injury and neurodevelopmental disabilities um, in place for all the young offender units. So, so all kids coming into custody will be now screened for neurodevelopmental disabilities alongside the mental health issues. Um, and a trawl of uh, some of the initial data from this uh, uh, um, study that we're running of 100 plus young offenders revealed that 80% in this population had a brain injury. And the brain injury was associated with much greater uh, chances of self-harm, not accounted by depression. So the brain injury is doing something different, not necessarily making more depressed, but problems with coping and so on. Uh, how does it fit with uh, other studies uh, internationally and more generally? Well, the rates are very much along the same lines. There's studies coming out in New York just recently, uh, in Australia, um, in Canada, the same levels. The, um, you're three to four to five times more likely to have brain injuries if you're in the prison population than if you're, if you're, if you're not, across a whole range of, of, uh, of uh, justice systems. Um, and um, in, and now you know, one of the areas is kind of okay. We can start to document these kind of brain injuries, but what do we do about them? Um, is it just a case of well, we know about it, but does that does it matter? Um, well, it does matter because the brain injury will make it more likely that they will not be paying attention to people who are trying to rehabilitate, rehabilitate them. Uh, they won't remember what they're supposed to do when they leave prison, um, and there will problems with impulse control, and importantly, things like emotion processing. This is a, uh, a study we've just finished, the pilot study, uh, to look at emotion processing in young offenders with and without brain injury. And it's a task uh, developed by a, gr a group in Bristol we're working with. Um, and what we find is that the kids with brain injury in, um, tend to not be very good at picking up on complex emotions. So they're not very good at picking up on disgust and, and surprise and what's really going on in somebody else's mind. They're not very good at it. So what do they do? They, they, be they become either frightened or a little bit suspicious and become worrisome. So that may well be something that we can treat because there's some interesting trials on, on um, uh, changing the way that people perceive people's facial expressions and then change their behavior through that. Um, I won't tell you about this, but it's in your handout, um, uh, but I'll just tell you very briefly. There's some really nice work coming out suggesting that um, neuroimaging is, good, is potentially a way forward for predicting who's going to be future offenders. Um, and the work of our own in the States suggesting, and this links nicely to, to talks earlier today, the, the anterior cingulate, the area of the brain to do is stop signal, to be able, the area of the brain to, to help you to stop doing what you're doing. A lack of activity in this area seems to be associated with increased chances of offending in the future. So we need to develop more strategies about how do we target these kinds of systems. So brain injury and crime, uh, there's lots of confounding factors. It's a very complex area. Uh, Risk-taking personality, impulsive ADHD. ADHD is a risk factor for having a brain injury. Um, you can have secondary ADHD after you're having a brain injury. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's very hard to be, uh, to, to be highly specific about the role of brain injury linking to specific crime uh, problems. But it does seem to be a major factor. And it's a very useful factor to know about. If there's a brain injury history in, uh, in a person that you're working with, then that's going to be massively linked to a whole host of other issues um, that would be likely to be um, associated with greater violence and also problems in coping. Um, just as a kind of a slight segue away from traumatic brain injury, this is a, a report we produced for the Office of the Children's Commission a couple of years ago on the rates of various neurodevelopmental disabilities in kids, young people in custody, learning disabilities, dyslexia, communication disorders, ADHD, um, and the rates are just massive. We should just basically see young offender units as um, places where there's lots of kids with neurodisabilities who really should have more rehabilitation that's neurologically focused. Um, and just over here, for example, communication disorders running at 60 to 90 percent. So how can they even follow what a barrister is cross-examining them for? How can they understand what's the nature of their true crime, uh, if they did it or not? Um, Adrian Rain would say that uh, we systematically ignored some of these biological factors in terms of crime. We heard earlier about there's been a focus on the social factors in crime, which is important, but there's also biological factors that are important in crime. And it's important to see them as maybe accelerators of the way in which somebody could become more likely to be an offender. Um, 
as I mentioned, uh, there is more and more kind of uh, awareness of, of these kind of neurodevelopmental disabilities in the, prison, in, in the young offender kind of populations. Uh, there's more capacity now to try to assess for these conditions, but we need to be more um, mindful of the interventions that we can then bring to, to bear. We um, already heard about some of the interventions, particularly looking at ADHD medication, and, um, and one of the ideas here is that if we reduce the impulsivity in people with ADHD, then we reduce crime. I also mentioned that emotion processing might be a big problem in this population, and this certainly seems to be uh, a, an interesting area um, uh, to be looked at, which is an area that we're, we're currently exploring. Some of the other projects we have ongoing at the moment, I thought I'd just share this with you briefly. Uh, we're currently looking at the Swedish population um, uh, with all its, all its vagaries in terms of what you can do in terms of temporal coherence. Um, but we're looking at the uh, Swedish population data sets to be clear about when brain injuries happen, when crime happen, and then link that to a health economics analysis so we can be better about understanding when we need to invest um, money in intervention and rehabilitation. We're also running a study with um, uh, Tom McMillan in Glasgow, uh, linking data from the NHS to uh, data in prisons. And uh, an early look at that data suggests that 15% of the adult prisoners in Glasgow have moderate severe brain injury, as indicated in imaging. So they have the kind of uh, hemorrhaging um, on the brains, uh, indicative of moderate severe brain injuries. Uh, we're also running link worker projects through the uh, two main young offender units in the north of England at the moment through the Disabilities Trust. So these uh, uh, um, uh, rehabilitation kind of work is put into prison to uh, better assess and manage and help assist the prison staff manage kids with brain injury or wish slots. And also working with the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies um, programs to assess um, brain injury in context of providing uh, cognitive behaviour therapy. So, uh, in sort of summing up, the children who are most likely to get injured from a social deprivation perspective are the ones who are most deprived and they're least likely to get support. And what seems to have happened in our societies and many others um, are that these are the kids who grow up to be the people who end up in our prison systems, unfortunately. They don't grow out the problems, they seem to grow uh, into them. Uh, they become more impulsive, more problems with others. Uh, interesting that we found that there was a much higher rate of cannabis use in the kids with brain injury in, in prisons as well. So they're, they're, they're experimenting with drugs to try to figure out how they can manage themselves. Brains become minds when they learn to dance with other brains. Unfortunately, we don't give them that opportunity. Uh, and to borrow an analogy from economics, by investing early and well in our children's development, um, who then become the adults of tomorrow, we can increase the rate of return in later in life. And so doing improve not only the lives of individuals, but our societies as well. That's my rather political take at the end. Thank you for your attention.